Good afternoon and good evening. Uh, members of the Imperial community and honored guests, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the 33rd Schrodinger Lecture. This is always one of the highlights of the year. And while we miss the fellowship of our gathering, this virtual event has allowed us to have a, a larger audience than ever. Let me note that the event is being recorded and our speaker will have the chance to take questions at the end. You may submit questions via the Q&A facility on the right hand of your screen. This lecture is a tribute to the brilliance and lasting influence of the work of Professor Erwin Schrodinger. And it is an opportunity to hear exciting new discoveries from some of the world's greatest researchers. Imperial has long had a special connection to Schrodinger. A celebration of the centenary of his birth was held at Imperial 34 years ago. Much like today's lecture, that celebration was a global gathering of distinguished scholars. We are pleased to have Schrodinger's grandson and our professor of quantum physics, Terry Rudolph, here tonight, along with one of Schrodinger's granddaughters, Bernadette Blackman, and great grandsons, Freddie and Bertie Blackman. Welcome to you all. We continue to honor Professor Schrodinger's memory through the Schrodinger Scholarships. These prestigious scholarships attract our most outstanding PhD students in natural sciences, and we are very grateful to those who support these talented scholars. Your philanthropy is making a tremendous difference in advancing science and supporting brilliant students. You can enjoy a virtual exhibition of the Schrodinger Scholar's work after the lecture. Tonight's speaker is a world leader in biochemistry and genetics, a wonderful person, Nobel laureate, and awe-inspiring speaker, Professor Jennifer Dudna. It is not only fitting to have one Nobel laureate pay tribute to another, there is also perhaps a more direct link between Professor Dudna and Professor Schrodinger. Schrodinger is, of course, best known for developing quantum theory, earning him the 1933 Nobel Prize in Physics. Less known, perhaps, is that in 1944, he also wrote an important book entitled, What is Life? Exploring the idea of genetic information encoded in the configuration of chemical bonds. Both James Watson and Francis Crick credited this book as an inspiration for their research into the double helix. Some years later, a young Jennifer Dudna, a self-proclaimed nerd, came home from school one day to find the double helix by James Watson on her bed, courtesy of her father. Devouring this book inspired her, and here we are today. Jennifer is the Li Ka Shing Chancellor's Chair and a professor in the Departments of Chemistry and of Molecular and Cell Biology at the University of California, Berkeley. As you will hear tonight, her groundbreaking development of CRISPR-Cas9 as a genome engineering technology with collaborator Emmanuel Charpentier not only earned the two, the two of them the 2020 Nobel Prize in Chemistry, it forever changed the course of human and agricultural genomics research. This powerful technology enables scientists to change DNA, the code of life, with a precision only dreamed of just a few years ago. Laboratories worldwide have redirected the course of their research programs to incorporate this new tool, creating a CRISPR revolution with huge implications across biology and medicine. Jennifer is a Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator, senior investigator at Gladstone Institutes, and the president of the Innovative Genomics Institute. She co-founded and she, she co-founded and serves on the advisory panel of several companies that use CRISPR technology in unique ways. In addition to her scientific achievements, she is a leader in public discussion of the ethical implications of genome editing for bio, human biology and societies. And she advocates for thoughtful approaches to the development of policies around the safe use of CRISPR technology. Jennifer has been duly honored for her work. She is a member of the National Academies of Sciences, of Medicine, and of, of Inventors, 
and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. She is also a foreign member of the Royal Society and has received numerous other honors, including the Breakthrough Prize in Life Sciences, the Japan Prize, Cavalry Prize, and the Wolf Prize in Medicine, to name a few. It's wonderful to have you with us this evening, Jennifer. Thank you for joining us, and we welcome you to Imperial and look forward to a visit with you again in the future. Thank you very much, President Gast. It's a great honor and pleasure to be here virtually. Of course, I, I look forward to opportunities to visit again in person, but I'm, I'm delighted to have the chance to talk with all of you this evening and to discuss the science of CRISPR, which is an incredible uh, technology that came out of a very sort of humble uh, background, as I'll describe, to understand the function of a bacterial immune system that is uh, known as CRISPR. And I just want to double check that everyone uh, sees the slides. Yes. I'm not hearing any complaints, so I think we're good. Great. Um, so I'd like to, what I want to do tonight is to talk about three aspects of CRISPR. I want to first introduce what it is and talk a bit about the science behind the technology. Then I would like to discuss the, uh, the way that CRISPR is being used for genome editing, what that is and, and why it's exciting. And then in the third part, I want to dive into some of the work that's going on currently in my lab and with collaborators that is advancing the technology towards clinical use. And what's one thing that's extraordinary to appreciate is that even though the technology is, is only uh, less than 10 years old, it's already being used in clinical trials and to help people that are suffering from genetic disease. So it's, a, it's an amazing advance that I think speaks to the, the, the extraordinary progress of science and the way that scientists now globally are able to quickly get onto ideas and move them forward when there are opportunities. And we'll see that, I'll say a little bit at the end also about how CRISPR is being used in the face of the current pandemic. So, uh, so what is CRISPR? And it's, it's basically a technology that enables something called programmable genome editing. And in the cartoon here, which is based on actual uh, molecular structures, this technology works by the action of a protein shown here in green that is able to recognize double-stranded DNA in a cell at a particular place in the DNA sequence that matches the sequence of a molecule of RNA that this CRISPR protein carries around. And that matching, uh, that sequence match triggers local DNA unwinding, enabling the CRISPR Cas protein to cut DNA. And I have a, a little uh, video here that shows this in action. So we're watching the CRISPR Cas9 molecule of, uh, with its RNA guide sitting on a DNA helix. And right there, you actually saw the helix get cut. And that's fundamentally what this system does. It cuts DNA and in the process allows cells to make changes precisely to the DNA at the position of the original break. So where did this come from? And I think one of the wonderful things about the story of CRISPR is that it began with small science. It began with a few scientists who were curious about the way that bacteria fight viral infection and how they might do this using a programmable system that allows RNA molecules to guide proteins to virus uh, DNAs or RNAs in infected cells and, and destroy them. And so to, uh, to illustrate this, I have a, have a uh, sort of an artist's uh, rendition of how CRISPR works. So we're watching cells growing in a biofilm. Here's one being infected by a, a bacteriophage. And if the cell has a CRISPR system in its genome, it's able to acquire a piece of the viral DNA at a special place in the genome called the CRISPR. And it consists, consists of repeated sequences that flank bits of integrated DNA. 
The cell makes an RNA copy of that CRISPR sequence. The RNA copy is chopped into shorter bits that include a piece of the viral sequence in each RNA molecule. And then together with a second RNA called tracer, these RNAs combine with the CRISPR-Cas9 protein to provide a surveillance complex that searches the cell looking for a DNA sequence that matches the sequence of the guide RNA that came from a virus. When the match occurs, the CRISPR-Cas9 protein cuts the DNA, and in bacteria, that leads to rapid destruction of the DNA. So it's a wonderful, very interesting evolutionary solution to the problem of viral infection that allows bacteria to essentially learn about their infectors and then store a genetic record of infection in their own DNA and then use that information for protection against future infection. So really very, very interesting biology that really up until um, I would say, you know, the mid 2000s had, had really not been appreciated by the scientific community. Now, um, one of the things that's very interesting about uh, DNA double-stranded breaks is that uh, in eukaryotic cells, plant or animal or human cells, double-stranded breaks in DNA are detected and often repaired. So that's a bit different than what happens in very rapidly growing bacterial cells. And this is a cartoon that shows, uh, the, that illustrates this idea. And, and so when DNA in a eukaryotic cell is cleaved to make a double-stranded break, cells can repair the break by making a small change to the DNA sequence that can in some cases disrupt uh, a gene or uh, a, a message in the DNA that encodes an important signal, or the cell can integrate a new piece of genetic material at the site of the double-stranded break to introduce new genetic information. Now, this was all research that had been done in the two or three decades prior to the uh, the, the work initially on CRISPR, but it turns out to be very important in the CRISPR story because once we understood how CRISPR systems are able to make a double-stranded break in DNA, it was immediately clear that this tool, this, this uh, system that evolved in bacteria as an immune system could be harnessed as a tool in other cell types to trigger genome editing. And to illustrate how that works, I have a video here that shows uh, a eukaryotic cell where the DNA is inside the nucleus. And once the CRISPR-Cas9 system with its guide RNA gets into a cell like this, it's able to search through the DNA looking for a matching sequence, a sequence that matches the sequence of its RNA guide. When that match occurs, the DNA melts open and form allowing the protein to form an RNA DNA helix at the site of the match. And then the protein cuts both strands of the DNA, just like a rope, to create a double-stranded break that can be handed off to repair proteins in the cell to create the actual edit. And so this is one thing to appreciate about CRISPR is that it initiates the editing, but it doesn't actually do the editing itself. That's carried out by other uh, proteins inside the cell. And uh, this, was, this was really the uh, work that I did with my collaborator, Emmanuel Charpentier, was figuring out how this protein Cas9 works as an RNA-guided DNA cleaver. And importantly, our, our, uh, the, the two members of our laboratories that were doing this, Chris Chylinski and Emmanuel's group, and Martin Yinek and my group, figured out they could simplify the system compared to the way it evolved in bacteria to create a way to use this as a, a, a pretty a pretty easy to apply programmable pair of molecular scissors that scientists could program to cut any desired DNA sequence. And that was really the, the genesis of this technology, was recognizing that you could use it as a tool to trigger targeted changes in the genome of, of essentially any type of cell. And so that, um, that has led to so many opportunities for using CRISPR for genome editing. And I wanted to just briefly describe 
um, a couple of the applications that I think are, are farthest along that really illustrate the opportunities with CRISPR. And first of all, it's important to point out that there are you know, so many applications of this kind of genetic manipulation. I think you know I like to I like to point out that you know I think CRISPR came along uh, in the scientific community at an opportune time when there was increasing availability of genetic and genomic sequencing data. We had more and more information about genes that cause human disease and lead to other kinds of phenotypes that we observe in organisms in our on our planet. And what was missing was a technology for manipulating that genomic information. And that's really what CRISPR provides. And so today we're seeing um, incredible applications in fundamental research, learning about uh, everything from butterfly wing patterns to how bipedalism evolved in mammals. I kid you not. And, uh, and then of course that kind of fundamental knowledge then extends to applications in both medicine and agriculture, where it's increasingly possible to use CRISPR to manipulate one or more genes in cell types that affect the clinical outcomes in patients that have a genetic disease, as well as to impact the kind of features that we see in agricultural crops, as well as other kinds of plants that are going to enable extraordinary opportunities in the future, both for, um, for uh, applications in food production, as well as, I think, in addressing some of the big challenges in, in climate change. Now, I wanted, to, um, I wanted to point out that in uh, clinical medicine, the use of CRISPR-Cas9 as not only a tool of discovery, but also an actual therapy is already uh, proceeding. And so amazingly, there's already uh, clinical work happening in which patients that have this particular genetic disorder can be treated using CRISPR. And just to, to illustrate how this would work, so in uh, patients that have sickle cell disease, they have a mutation, it's a single uh, base pair change in a gene encoding the uh, human beta globin protein, which is essential for carrying oxygen in red blood cells. And this leads to, in, in sickle cell patients, to a form of hemoglobin that is prone to aggregation and to forming the, the classic sickled uh, shape of these blood cells that leads to occlusion of blood vessels and, you know, a lot of um, uh, downstream effects that include organ damage and, and certainly a very difficult uh, uh, life where these patients often have to receive repeated blood transfusions, et cetera. And with CRISPR, in fact, one of the early uh, tests of this technology was to show that you could use the CRISPR tool to correct the disease-causing mutation in cells that were derived from sickle cell patients and do that in the laboratory. And today, we're already seeing the impact of this technology in actual patients. And I have on the next slide a picture of Victoria Gray, who was actually the first uh, patient to receive this, uh, this treatment in the United States. And there are patients in, in uh, I think, I believe in the UK and other uh, countries as well that have now received this. And the great news is that it works. It's been an incredible demonstration of the power of a technology like this to have real world impact on people that otherwise would have few other options. And, uh, and so this is, a, this is a tool that I think increasingly we're going to see uh, uh, advances in treatments that involve uh, treating patients like this where it's possible to make edits to particular cell types or particular tissues that affect that patient you know, in a way that is uh, beneficial and, and frankly very reminiscent of other kinds of, of more traditional therapies and that the, the technology affects just that one individual. But I do want to point out that with CRISPR, there is an alternative to this that, um, that I think is very important to be uh, grappled with, and that is the potential of applying CRISPR in what's called the human germline. And that means making heritable changes to human DNA that can be passed on 
to future generations. Now this potential became very clear early in the research that was being done on CRISPR-Cas9. And I've been quite involved over the last few years in meetings, including uh, the, the one that led to this report shown here that have um, really tackled this, this ethically challenging question of whether, whether and when to use CRISPR in, a, in, in, in the human germline in ways that could impact future generations. But we might argue in some cases, at least in the future, it may become um, a treatment of choice for, for certain types of disease. And so this is very much an active uh, area of discussion. And I, I think there's actually a meeting that will happen later this year in the UK um, on this topic. So now I just want to, I want to turn to um, the, the, sorry about that, uh, turn to some of the science behind using CRISPR in the clinic. And, and I, one thing I want to point out is that the field of, of CRISPR and genome editing continues to advance incredibly rapidly. It's very exciting. And it's, uh, you know, there, we, I certainly have the sense that we're still at the beginning in many ways of the technology, really understanding it as well as applying it to, um, you know, to, to, uh, to make changes in, in, uh, in, in clinical medicine that I think eventually will allow this to become a standard of care for certain kinds of disease. And so I want to address three uh, questions that I'll tell you a little bit about how we're, we're doing this in the laboratory um, that I think pertain to how CRISPR will be used in the future in the clinic. And the first is how we ensure the precision of editing. And, and this really illustrates one of the exciting things about, about CRISPR, which is that it's, it's truly a, a platform in the sense that it's a, it's a technology that relies on recognition of DNA, and many clever people have been able to then take that fundamental property of CRISPR and expand it to do things that it doesn't seem to do naturally. And this is one example. And so this is showing you a, a pie chart of the human, the known human single nucleotide polymorphisms. That means single base pair changes that are known to cause disease in human beings. And when we look at that chart, you can see that about half of them could be fixed, they could be corrected if we had a way to chemically alter an AT base pair in DNA to a GC base pair in DNA. And it turns out that that chemistry is actually possible um, and, um, and it's been possible to connect it to CRISPR into a in a format that's known as a base editing or ABE, and this is uh, this is actually a, a, a publication from the lab of David Liu, but there are other labs, uh, Kondo's lab in particular in Japan, who also pioneered this approach to expanding the use of CRISPR. And the idea here is that one can take the CRISPR Cas9 protein with its guide RNA and and append to it a, uh, a um, domain of, of uh, biochemical activity right here that has the ability to convert an adenosine, an A in DNA, to an inosine uh, over here. And then in uh, during DNA replication, this modified nucleotide then gets converted to a G. So it goes from A to I to G, and that results in a base pair change from of an AT to a GC, which sounds um, really easy when I describe it like that, but it required a number of steps to, uh, to achieve this. And the first was that there is no natural enzymatic activity that is able to recognize single-stranded or even double-stranded DNA and make an A to I or A to G conversion. And so what the lab of David Liu did was to take a protein well uh, understood from bacteria called TAD-A, which is naturally a tRNA editing enzyme, and run it through a number of cycles of directed evolution in which mutations were introduced into this protein to select for activity that would allow this 
original tRNA editing enzyme to be able to interact with single-stranded DNA. Now, most DNA in the cell, of course, is not single-stranded, it's double-stranded, but this is where the CRISPR system comes in because you may recall that when the, the fundamental way that CRISPR-Cas9 works is to melt open the DNA duplex and expose a DNA single strand. And that's where this domain is then able to get access to the DNA at that position and do its editing. And so this, uh, this approach went through a number of, of rounds of, um, of evolution in the laboratory and testing. And each of these iterations of the, the editing form of Cas9 had activity that looked promising, but had various, uh, various um, uh, challenges to it. For example, off-target uh, RNA editing is one, and, um, and then really just trying to boost the level of editing activity of these proteins. And so in, in our own lab, uh, we started a few years ago now, a collaboration with the lab of David Liu to test these proteins biochemically and really understand how they work in, uh, in a, a controlled setting. And we got a remarkable uh, result that was initially uh, very surprising. And that is that we tested uh, several versions of the, the, uh, the CRISPR-Cas9 A-base editor. And we found that most of them were very, very slow uh, enzymes. This is a plot that shows the production of the edited product over time. But one, uh, known as ABE8E from the Lou lab, was remarkably different. It was very, very fast, and in fact, uh, could actually conduct multiple editing reactions per enzyme molecule. So it had the ability to turn over uh, substrates in a way that we didn't observe for these other uh, earlier forms of A-base editors. So that was um, very interesting. And uh, of course, we wondered why and what was special about this particular uh, A-base editor. And so in a, uh, a three-way collaboration that involved the lab of Peter Beadle up at, at, at uh, UC Davis, so it's kind of just up the road from me in Berkeley, we took advantage of some beautiful chemistry that the Beadle lab had developed for trapping enzymes like TAD-A from bacteria in an intermediate step of the chemical conversion of an, of an adenine base to inosine. And so this is the chemistry that's normally carried out by the TAD-A enzyme in tRNA in bacteria. And what Peter Beal's lab had done was to develop an analog known as 8-azonebularin that could stop this reaction midstream and create a, an analog of the reaction intermediate that was not capable of further chemistry. And so using this strategy and with a lot of uh, effort by a postdoc of mine in the lab, Audrey Lapinate, and the, uh, the work of, uh, of Cody Palumbo, a student with Pete Beal, they made a series of different DNA molecules that had eight azonebularin positioned at different places along this part of the DNA that we knew would become single-stranded when recognized by CRISPR-Cas9. And uh, that allowed us to eventually trap a structure of this base editor that could be visualized using cryo-electron microscopy. And I just want to show you one uh, little movie of this. So this, uh, what you're seeing here is in white is the CRISPR-Cas9 protein and appended to it is the editing domain over here shown in red and pink. So this is a dimer, a kind of a dimeric uh, protein. So two of these proteins come together to form the active editor. And uh, what was really neat to see in the structure is that um, the, the editor sits right on the DNA at a place that is made accessible by the unwinding of the helix that, that's created by CRISPR-Cas9. And furthermore, when we examined the interactions of this uh, active site of the TAD-A protein with DNA, we found that all of the mutations that were introduced during the in vitro selection process in the lab occurred in this pocket. So they basically helped stabilize the structure of the DNA that's required for editing. And, and you can't quite see it here maybe, but the 8 azonebularin is poking right into the active site. So this was what we hoped would happen was that this 
nucleotide analog would be able to capture the uh, structure representing the, the enzyme in the act of, of, of conducting editing. Now, why does this matter? Well, uh, uh, I won't show you the data for today, but have been published, and this was worked on also by Gavin, uh, not in the laboratory. We know that this very, very fast uh, base editor is is wonderful for editing in cells because it's 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 very quick at its job. However, it's almost too good because it's able to edit DNAs outside of this um, uh, of this uh, sort of bubbled region of of the of the helix that's shown right here. And so, what is going on right now is finding ways to enhance the editing activity without allowing the activity to extend beyond this you know, very narrow window in the DNA. And that's enabled by having the ability to look at the structure like this and really examine the molecular interactions that are required for base editing. Um, okay, so I wanna also, um, I wanna then just briefly mention that um, in addition to the original CRISPR-Cas9 protein that Emmanuel Charpentier and I worked on, we've also been interested to ask whether there might be alternative proteins that occur in nature. And as you might imagine, the answer is yes. And one of the most recent that we've been working on is a, a, a very tiny version of a CRISPR enzyme known as Cas5 that's encoded only in phage. So who knew? But it turns out that bacteriophage have their own version of CRISPR. And of course, they have a, a very compact version of it because their, their genomes are tiny. This protein is only about half the size of the, the CRISPR-Cas9 enzyme. So it's a, quite, a, quite a compact protein. It has its own uh, CRISPR array here in the, in the phage genome that creates RNAs that guide the activity of Cas5. And, by understanding how it works, and, and by the way, this is work that was done with uh, Jill Banfield, a colleague of mine at, at Berkeley, and our students Patrick and, and Bassam, we know that um, that uh, this this enzyme is not only uh, active in, in in phage at its natural setting, but it also can be active in uh, biochemically and in other kinds of cells. And I'll just briefly show you a, a couple of features of this protein that we think are very intriguing. So one is that um, it's a very tiny, very, very compact CRISPR system. And so if we look at the combination of the protein plus its RNA, it's got the smallest uh, molecular weight compared to any of the known, other known uh, CRISPR-Cas enzymes. And why does that matter? Well, it's, for one thing, it's, uh, it might make it uh, easier to understand its molecular functions because we know that this is a, a really streamlined uh, version of CRISPR-Cas. And secondly, it may have uh, chemical properties that will lend themselves to delivery into different cells in the clinic. So this is also something that is being uh, currently explored by us and, and now others. And so this is the kind of experiment that we can do to test the activity of a protein like this. We take uh, cells, these are cultured uh, human embryonic kidney cells, and we can use a, um, a, a mode of delivery that introduces a piece of DNA that encodes the Cas5 protein with appropriate uh, guide RNAs. And in this experiment, this was targeting a gene that's been embedded in these in embryonic kidney cells, encoding a green fluorescent protein. And so it makes it very easy to test for genome editing because we can target that uh, green fluorescent protein gene and then easily separate cells that have been uh, edited from those that have not. And that's just uh, some data for that type of experiment is shown over here where we can use different versions of guide RNAs and see different degrees, different efficiencies of editing in these cells. And then very recently, Patrick Pausch, who's a current uh, postdoc in the laboratory, has been working on structural studies of Cas5. And I just want to show you one snapshot of this. This is a currently unpublished data where we can see the way the Cas5 protein has a very tight interaction with its guide RNA, which is the orange with a target uh, molecule of DNA. So there's, um, it's a really streamlined enzyme. We can see all in, in quite uh, a lot of detail how this 
helix in the enzyme is, is, uh, is accommodated and how the protein is able to unwind uh, duplex DNA. And we're currently working to understand its biochemical functions and also to understand properties that we think will be useful in the future for applications in, uh, in either clinical medicine or, or, uh, or agriculture or both. And then uh, the third question I just want to briefly address is how CRISPR-Cas editing enzymes can be delivered into specific cell types. To me, this is probably currently the biggest uh, bottleneck in the field. I think that we, we appreciate the, the, the extraordinary opportunities of CRISPR in the laboratory. And the challenge now is to take those opportunities, that the, the technical capabilities, and make sure that these systems, these proteins can be delivered efficiently into cells where they will have clinical benefit. Harder to do than, than to say. Um, and I'm, I'm just gonna give you one example of this um, and, uh, and relate it back to something that is actually happening currently in, in the clinic. So this is a paper that was published uh, just about a year ago from the lab of Carl June in, uh, in the US in, at the University of Pennsylvania, where they've been using CRISPR engineered T cells in patients with uh, cancer. And this therapy works by uh, removing uh, T cells from, from a patient and then conducting genome editing in the laboratory that will activate uh, these cells for cancer recognition and, and um, an attack in the body. And so this is a, one example of how this can work. And so very um, familiar to those of you that know about cancer immunotherapy. So it's really coupling genome editing with cancer immunotherapy in a way that then allows these edited cells to be reintroduced into the patient and to uh, go to work against the tumor. And so this is, this is a strategy that has a lot of promise. Um, and at the same time, I think there are some very real challenges, one of which is this business of having to do all of the editing in cells that are taken from the patient, which as you might imagine, takes time and, and, um, and also maybe has to be uh, honed specifically for, for each individual, which again, just increases the time and cost of a therapy like this. And so we've been asking, and this is now work of, of three uh, wonderful uh, scientists in the lab, Jenny uh, Hamilton, Connor Sushita, and Abby Stahl. Two of, uh, Abby and Jenny are postdocs, Connor is a student. And they've been working together to ask whether we could create virus-like particles that could be little packages that would deliver pre-assembled Cas guide RNA complexes into cells. And, and I, there are two other, uh, another couple of names here, David Nyan and, and Brian Shai, who are two MD PhDs at UCSF in the lab of Alex Marson, a uh, great immunologist who have been uh, helping us with this. And the strategy is to design CRISPR uh, to be uh, able to target genes relevant to T cell engineering and then package them in a virus that has been gutted of the genes that allow it to be infectious, but retain genes that allow it to form this very nice capsid with proteins projecting from the surface that enable recognition uh, and entry into particular cell types. And so the strategy then briefly is to encode uh, some of these, uh, these uh, proteins from the virus that are required to form capsids together with a fusion protein called uh, GAG-Cas9 in this case that allows expression of Cas9 in a way that enables packaging into these capsids and then cleavage from the membrane to release the assembled protein guide RNA inside the capsid. And we can actually co-deliver this with, uh, in some cases, a piece of donor DNA, which are these little green uh, molecules here that provide the information for DNA repair that allows integration of new genetic information um, based on sort of triggered by Cas9 cutting. And I just wanna, I wanna just very briefly show that this kind of strategy allows us to make uh, chimeric antigen receptors, these CARs in these cells, as well as to uh, knock out other genes that will help activate these T cells in a way that's relevant to cancer immunotherapy. This is showing uh, editing of two types of T cells that are 
that have two different types of receptor uh, proteins on the surface, CD4 positive cells and CD8 positive cells. And importantly, we can actually do this in a way that allows targeted editing of cells with just one type of receptor. And this is an example where we've been able to specifically target the CD4 positive T cells in a mixed cell population so that we only get editing of these that particular type of T cells. And we're really excited about the potential of this technology in the future to enable in vivo editing in, we hope eventually in patients that will be valuable for the kind of applications that um, that you know we envision for uh, cancer immunotherapy and we think other other uh, uh, therapies in the future. And then of course we're we're also interested in other other modes of editing and this is just an example from work of Brett Stahl, Jen Sabo, and Abby uh, in the lab in which they've been able to engineer the Cas9 protein for cell penetration and allow editing in this case of, uh, of cells in the brain. This is doing experiments in mice where we inject these engineered forms of the Cas9 protein across the blood brain barrier and we observe increasing amounts of editing corresponding to increasing amounts of injected CRISPR Cas9. And this is a strategy that Brett uh, Stahl originally developed to use in a mouse model of Huntington's disease, and we're now working with other colleagues at UCSF to develop it as a, a therapy for uh, also for glioblastoma. So I, I just want to uh, end with one um, thought about sort of where this is going in the future um, in in directions that don't involve uh, genome editing. And one of the, again, one of the amazing things about the CRISPR system is that the more we study it, the more we learn uh, about its, its, uh, its capabilities. And one of them is that uh, there are CRISPR-Cas proteins that naturally have the ability to report on recognition of a target sequence. And this has come into the, really to the fore with the current pandemic because it's now possible to use CRISPR as a, a way to diagnose infections such as with the SARS-CoV-2 virus that causes COVID-19. And this is just one um, example of this. So this in, in work that was uh, done originally by a wonderful a former a graduate student of mine, Alex uh, East Selesky, and also in work at MIT, it was possible to show that you could use a protein uh, called CRISPR-Cas13 for direct RNA-guided recognition of RNA, and then by coupling its, its uh, activation as a ribonuclease, as an enzyme that cuts RNA, with reporter RNA molecules that contain a quenched fluorophore pair of dyes, this system then becomes a way to quickly detect the presence of an RNA sequence that you can decide on by programming it with a desired uh, guide RNA, that will then trigger release of a fluorescent signal that is easily detected. And this is fundamentally the, uh, the, the chemistry behind current CRISPR diagnostics that are being developed. And I'm really excited to be part of a, an active uh, five lab academic consortium at, at Berkeley, UCSF and the Gladstone Institutes that has led to um, some, I think, really exciting advances using this system, including a paper that was published uh, recently by, uh, with the senior author uh, being Melanie Ott, one of our collaborators, showing that you could actually use this technology for SARS-CoV-2 uh, detection in patient samples. So I'm just going to wrap up there and, and point out that, you know, understanding the molecular mechanisms of these enzymes is critical, I think, for future development of fast, accurate proteins that are going to be useful for genome editing and, and beyond, including for diagnostics, and that continued discovery of additional proteins such as the compact editor that I showed you provides new strategies for clinically useful tools. And of course, we are excited about the potential to eventually have a way to deliver these enzymes in C2 in patients so that um, this, this technology can help as many people as possible and, uh, and do so in an affordable and accessible fashion. Very grateful to a huge uh, a number of my colleagues. This is obviously a pre-pandemic uh, photograph, sort of hard to, almost hard to imagine now taking this kind of a picture, but, um, and this was uh, taken uh, in the summer before the pandemic when we had about 15 
undergraduate students working in the laboratory. So I've been really proud to be able to open the lab, um, at least pre-pandemic, and we'll do that again uh, when we can, to undergraduate students who come in and are able to work with a number of these talented graduate uh, students and postdocs on projects that I described. And then finally, just you know, huge uh, thanks to Emmanuel Charpentier, wonderful collaboration with her laboratory and our former lab members, Martin Yinek and Chris Chylinski, who did the fundamental work on CRISPR-Cas9. And then, of course, uh, grateful to all of our support here as well. Thank you very much. And I'm going to uh, stop sharing now so that we can uh, go to questions. Okay. okay, thank you very much, Jennifer. That was uh, it was like watching science fiction come come to life. I I, 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 almost, I was a bit of a nerd myself when I was younger, and I wouldn't have believed if someone had told me that I wouldn't have wouldn't have believed it back then. So I've got a couple of questions. Uh, one from my colleague Terry Rudolph. Um, if there was a sudden massive increase in computing power available, what problems in your field would it be most usefully applied to? I think um, I think it would be most useful in um, in in really dissecting the interactions between genes. I think this is one of the things that is still really really challenging about understanding the human genome or, or frankly uh, any other genome is you know how 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 do genes interact? And I'll give you just one quick example, and that is that you know there are many instances in human biology where you see in a family that uh, you know many members of a family inherit a particular type of, of gene, but only some of those family members become affected by it or you know, are susceptible to a disease or are can be treated with a certain type of therapy. Why is that? You know, and that's and that's one of the things that we're now starting to address using CRISPR-Cas9. Actually, is through genetic um, uh, profiling and trying to understand all of the genes that contribute to particular phenotypes. And I think we're, what we're, what's essential there is having the computing power to be able to sort out those very complex interactions and make sense of them. Okay, sort of leads sort of slightly into some of the ethical problems or ethical issues. Maybe maybe problems is maybe the wrong word, but uh, so there's several, several questions to dwell on. Um, so for instance, how, how, how do we improve public confidence in genome editing? And how do we allay the fears of, of the public? It all sounds a bit scary. You're going to edit my genes? Yeah. How, it does. <laughs> how, how, how do we stop the scariness? I, I do think that critical to that is, um, is scientific you know, engagement and involvement in those conversations. So I've, I've, I've become convinced that you know, it, it's really important to have transparency around the technology finding ways to communicate about it um, that get across fundamentally what it is and what it does and what it, what it isn't, you know? And I think that's, that's key. And uh, I do think the media has a really important role to play here. We're already seeing, I don't know, there are Netflix, uh, you know, series that mention CRISPR and things like that. It's, it's, uh, and so I do think that it's essential that, it, you know, again, that scientists be engaging with that process so that we ensure that to the extent possible, scientific fact is kind of under, underlying those communications. Okay, and so another one from, from Actually, it's unfortunately, it says anonymous, but it says, what, what do you think of George Church's goal to reverse aging by 2030? <laughs> am, am, am I going to become 21 again? I guess the that's the question. The older I get, the more, uh, well, the, my, my first answer is the older I get, the more interested I am in that. Uh, <laughs> um, good luck to him, you know, if, he's, if he succeeds at doing that, uh, wonderful. I, I do think that you know there's a lot of, of really fundamental biology we don't understand about the aging process, and by by uncovering it using CRISPR and other tools, I think we're gonna we're gonna have uh, gain a lot of insight just into you know fundamentally what makes us human. Okay, and then uh, then there's quite a few questions by by colleagues who sort of touch up on gender kind of questions. So one of them is. What challenges have you faced as a woman in a field mostly dominated by men, and how did you overcome them? That's from Matilda. Yeah, I, you know, I've been asked this question before, as you can imagine, and uh, and I, I think you know my my 
my short answer is that I feel very fortunate that in my career, I've had a lot of great mentors, male and female, who have been incredibly encouraging to me at different times in my in my training. That that was critical. And it really did begin with my father, you know, as you heard in, in uh, President Gast's introduction, you know, my, my dad was not a scientist, but 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 interested in science. He was a literature professor and uh, he loved, you know, he loved reading about science. And so, um, you know, that that for me has been, uh, you know, important, I think, to throughout my, my life, really, to look for mentors who are encouraging and supportive. And, uh, and that's not unique to, to being female, of course, but I do think that what I've observed, I see it in myself and I, I see it in my female trainees. I do think that women um, tend to be more self-doubting. Uh, I don't know if it's our, our culture or what, what the reason is, but you know, I think women may need more uh, sort of you know, uh, confidence building as they're especially early in their training. So I really encourage especially women to look for mentors that can provide that kind of support when they're uh, early in their career. Okay. There's also quite a lot of questions. Sorry to jump around between topics so so almost so, so rapidly, but there's also quite a lot of questions on agritech and agriculture and the future of food. Um, uh, someone asked, do you think that CRISPR has the potential to eradicate global food insecurity? I think it has that potential. I do. Um, I feel increasingly excited, honestly, about what's happening with CRISPR in agriculture. And I'm, you know, I'm not a plant biologist, so I'm really a person observing this, you know, happening in other labs. But I think it's it's extraordinary, you know, the, the opportunities now. As you probably know, plants have really big genomes. They're really genetically complex, you know, makes us humans look uh, simple by comparison. And to have a technology that allows precise manipulation of, of individual uh, genes or sets of genes in plants is, is truly enabling. Will this lead, you know, or maybe you could say, you could turn your question around and say, you know, how soon will this lead to real practical uh, impacts? And I would say there that we're already seeing um, plants coming to market that have interesting properties, you know, that uh, that either extend um, their, you know, have, you know, give them, give them uh, properties that are useful or at least interesting, like mushrooms that don't turn brown. You've maybe seen the news about that. Um, and I think in the future, you know, there will be uh, increasing applications of CRISPR to create crops that have higher yields. This has already been done by Zach Lipman's lab at, at uh, Cold Spring Harbor to increase tomato yields and could potentially be done in other types of crops, as well as to create crops that are resistant to drought, a, a challenge with especially with climate change, uh, resistant to pests, and maybe have higher nutritional value. So I think those are all uh, opportunities that are in front of us now. So. Uh, one of the one one thing from the the giving giving a talk online is that the range. There's one here from a biology teacher in Minnesota. So uh, I'm rather pleased that Fantastic. biology teacher in Minnesota has managed managed to come in come into us in London. It covers a unit on genetic engineering, and she asks, it's, her name's Kim. What do you recommend high school students consider when assessing the ethics of CRISPR technology through both an, an equity and health lens? I think there's quite a lot of, kind of these kind of ethics and kind of moral moral kind of questions about, I guess, we're altering life, which is a fundamental right. concern. Right, right. No, it's a really deep question, and it's uh, you know it deserves a, a much longer answer than I can give you now. But but I would I would say that um, for for high school students that are learning about this for the first time, I find you know I've done a, a few. Um, workshops and things with with uh, students even uh, younger than that you know in middle school and i find that a lot of these students are they're very thoughtful about this actually and they 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 under, they kind of intrinsically understand the technology you know they understand this idea of manipulating the code of life it really is you know that that sort of fundamental and i do think that um for them i mean this is their their future right this is going to increasingly impact their world going forward, and so I, I, I'm really um, hopeful that that generation will take up take up the call to dive into the the challenges of it. I think um, uh, one thing that we didn't really mention yet that I think is really really important that I think about a lot is is affordability and access, because you know it's one thing to have a treatment that can cure a sickle cell patient, um, but if it costs two million dollars U.S. 
uh, a patient, you know, it's going to be very, very hard to see how that can impact a large number of people, especially in uh, developing countries. So I'm personally very committed to finding ways to make this technology much more affordable and accessible. And of course, hand in hand with that is making sure that it's being deployed safely and responsibly at the same time. Yeah. So here in, in, the, in the developed world, um, another question is about the affordability. The affordability and scalar of CRISPR means that we're seeing it, increasingly seeing it used outside of non-traditional scientific environments. Uh, for community-led biohack spaces. Yeah. It's kind of exciting. We're, it's kind of empowering empowering almost lay scientists. Uh, I'm not sure I trust myself, of course, but you know, <laughs> to, 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 act, to actually you know, modify this. Um, it's kind of exciting and it's kind of unprecedented, but what are your views on the general public having access to such, such, such kind of scientific power? Well, I mean, I, I, I think it's, uh, on the, as you just said, you know, I completely agree that on the one hand, I think it's really kind of neat that a, you know, that a technology like this is as powerful as, as it is, is also accessible in a way to, you know, students or, or non-specialists non who want to try it out. Now, I'm, believe me, I'm not advocating, um, you know, genome editing yourself or your muscles or things like that. <laughs> But uh, but I do think that um, you know using CRISPR to you know make green yeast and things like that in in a in a high school laboratory is a great way for students to get hands on experience with this and 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 really uh, get a feeling for what what the power of it. Yeah, so that leads on to a a, a, a question which is about. Well, you know, given given this power, you know, we could we could sort of alter human evolution. Even I mean, it's it's such a tremendous thing to be able to do. Or in the wrong hands, it could sort of diminish the human experience. I think I think that would be a fair thing to say. Yeah. But what what safeguards can are, are there safeguards that we could put in place that would that would somehow limit this? Um, how do we how do we is it the case that we sort of let the genie out of the bottle? How how do we how do we control the genie? Yeah, great question. It's it's a big challenge, and not just with CRISPR, of course, but with any any emerging technology that you know is has kind of a transformative potential. I mean, the, another one that comes to mind is artificial intelligence, and there's lots of discussion, of course, now about this as well. I think in the case of CRISPR, um, I just feel that uh, it's it's essential to start with transparency and 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 open discussion. I've been very pleased that the Royal Society and the National Academies in the U.S. Have, have teamed up to, you know, really dive into this and hold global summits on the topic, uh, especially for human uh, genome editing. But all of that being said, you know, in the end, I don't think there's any way that globally one can enforce a set of a particular set of regulations. So it has to come down to individual responsibility and, you know, the, the global scientific community, I hope, making a very strong stand on how we think, you know, the technology should be deployed going forward. Okay, so with all these absolutely exciting transformative advances that we can see coming down, coming down the line towards us, but uh, what, how, how, how soon do you think we'll see the first impact of CRISPR on you know, day to day life? You know, what, 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 and also I guess the follow up is, which one of them would be the first? Well, I, if I had to guess, I, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking it may be actually in agriculture. You know, it may be in um, uh, fruits and vegetables that we can either grow in our gardens or uh, purchase at the market that will have properties that are, that are improved either through yield or, you know, other things that make them desirable. And that's, you know, again, it's a, it's a challenging area. As many people know, you know, there's a lot of sort of concern about you know is this a genetically modified organism then and does it need special regulation and of course different countries have different views about that um, but my own feeling is that i think that's likely to be the type of impact that we'll see all of us you know in our kind of daily lives the fastest with CRISPR. and then maybe closely behind that is going to be um, applications in, um, I think, probably in, in cancer immunotherapy, as I mentioned, I think that field is moving very quickly and having genome editing coupled with immunotherapy is powerful. Um, and, uh, and then beyond that, I think, you know, it'll really depend on 
the scientific community's ability to create effective delivery strategies that allow delivery of CRISPR-Cas into, say, muscle cells to cure diseases like muscular dystrophy and to lung epithelia for treating uh, diseases like cystic fibrosis. I mean, there's a lot of need out there, but right now the technology for delivery isn't quite there yet. Okay. There were, there, there were questions exactly on that topic, actually, because people obviously concerned about dystro muscular dystrophy in particular. Yeah. But um, I, I, guess, I guess that does lead us into personalized medicine. You know, how, how far away are we from the moment when my DNA gets taken, I get analyzed, you know, Richard, you're gonna, you're gonna, have, you're gonna have a heart attack or you're gonna have cancer in so, so, roughly so long, we'll edit your genes so you'll be, it will never even affect you. <laughs> as you say, as I get older, I get more concerned about these sorts of things. How far <laughs> away are we from that? Or is Probably. it possible even? Yeah, I think it's maybe possible, but not, not soon because I, I think that, um, for the most part, we don't know which genes need editing <laughs> for those kinds of effects. And, and of course, you know, again, my feeling is that one would certainly want to make sure first and foremost that any kind of genetic manipulation of that type was safe. Um, it's one thing if someone is, you know, has a terminal disease and they don't have other options, you might be willing to take a higher risk but for somebody who doesn't have that in their immediate future, you know, the risk, I think, has to be scaled accordingly. Okay. There are a couple of questions about sort of medical regulation. You know, it's such a new technique. It's such a new field. And it's um, uh, med med medicine and going through phase three or whatever and actually applying something to humans tends to take a very, very long time because you never want to make a mistake. So what are the issues about medical regulation and CRISPR, editing our genes? Um, are, are, there, are there issues there that are going to hold it back? Probably not, um, at least right now. I think that um, it's been very interesting that because of some of the regulatory framework that was laid down in the 1970s with molecular cloning in you know, the US and in, in, in Europe and, and the UK, I think that um, we're, we're fortunate that that framework actually has been quite relevant to the CRISPR technology as well. That being said, there certainly are going to be new uh, you know, challenges that come up uniquely when we talk about applying CRISPR in its most powerful capacity for personalized medicine. I'll just give you one quick example. You can imagine that for people that have, let's say, a disease like muscular dystrophy, there's a broad range of, of mutations in DNA that give rise to that disease. And so if you look at you know, a, a whole cohort of patients that have, have muscular dystrophy, they might have a range of, of, of different, um, you know, in, in detail, the, the mutations that they have are different. And so you might need to have different formats of CRISPR to treat each one of them or, or small sets of them. Is each of those formats going to, be going to be required to go through its own clinical trial? You know, phase one, phase two, phase three, if you're in the US. I, I think that's, on, that's just not, you know, it's, it's not practical. And so that's one current challenge is figuring out how do we appropriately test CRISPR technology without slowing it down too much, but in, while it's still ensuring that it's gonna be safe and effective. Okay, and uh, we're going to return back to back to the, uh, the school children again. But uh, James Johnson asks, can you recommend books for middle and high school students to give them a good grounding in genetics and genetic engineering? Is there anything out there that they could have? Gosh, well, you know, I think um, there there are, there are just a number of, of great books. I, I'm I'm probably not the best person to ask because all the books that I'm thinking of are uh, not recent, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, I think that, uh, you know, certainly if you read books by uh, Lewis Thomas, if you read books by, by um, you know, there's some other great writers that, you know, Harold Morowitz, I mean, these are all books that I read as a, as a young student that were very influential to me, you know, uh, 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 the, the wonderful book, The Eighth Day of Creation. I mean, these are all books that really explain genetics in a, in a tractable way. There's also a, the more recent book called The Gene by Sid Mukherjee uh, that talks about uh, genetics from a, you know, more of a kind of a non-specialist perspective. So I definitely um, think those are great. For younger uh, kids, um, 
I, I think multimedia is actually great. So I, I highly recommend uh, Khan Academy. This is a, a site that my own son has made a lot of use of. And I think they have a number of videos on Khan Academy that are actually quite effective at explaining the fundamentals of genetics and, and even CRISPR. Okay, that sounds really, really helpful, as you say, on, on, online learning. There's another question on learning, which is actually to do with entrepreneurship and starting companies and CRISPR. And it's actually about what you think about embedding entrepreneurship in teaching. And, uh, and do you have thoughts on, on that? I guess, it, I guess it's in the context of CRISPR. Yeah, you know, I, my thoughts on that, frankly, are evolving. And I'll, I'll, I'll just briefly explain why. So, you know, I, I grew up, you know, and I was sort of educated in a very traditional way in the sense that, you know, my, my teachers and, and professors were all academics and intellectuals who were kind of purists. And they were studying science for the sake of understanding fundamentals of nature. You know, and that was really kind of drilled into me for, a, you know, many years. And it wasn't until later, you know, after I was already had been a professor for at least a decade, that I started to appreciate that, you know, there are times when scientific discovery gets to a point where the natural next steps are just not steps that are appropriate for whatever reason to take in an academic setting. Either they cost too much money or they're kind of boring, they're essential, but kind of boring. They're not really educational opportunities for students. Um, and so, I've come to realize that you know it's very important to help students to kind of see the difference. You know, when when is a scientific project best for kind of best suited to an academic endeavor, and when is it maybe better suited to a, a more focused uh, and maybe even a commercial endeavor? And I right now I do that very informally. I don't have any kind of you know I don't teach a class on this or anything, but. Um, I do think it's important to, to teach our students about this because increasingly these are the choices they have when they are uh, scientifically trained. I, I Increasingly, I see my own students um, having opportunities to go to companies and, where they have to decide, is that the kind of, is that the way I want to do my science or, or, or do I want to stay in a more of an academic uh, nonprofit setting? Indeed, our, um, our students are having many more opportunity, opportunities for entrepreneurship style of things were not there when I was, when I was doing my PhD. So. Right. So I have one final question, um, which is which single potentially near term breakthrough could accelerate the real world value and impact of CRISPR? And that's asked by Matt James. Yeah, great question, Matt. I, I guess I would come back to what I said previously about delivery. You know, I think if there were a way to if I had a magic bullet that would allow delivery of CRISPR Cas into a desired uh, cell type efficiently, that would be huge. And, and frankly, it would be big in the clinical, you know, medicine sort of arena, but also in agriculture, right? If I could do that efficiently in plants, huge impact. So I think that's really, really important right now. And we, we need both kind of engineering, but frankly, I think we also need real innovation. Well, okay, well, I'm gonna have to close now, I think. But, so thank you so much. I, I, I thought it was just a wonderful lecture and, um, I'm very grateful for your time in, in giving us this, um, give, answering the questions. And it was just a wonderful talk. So it's really great to have you with us. And I'm so sorry that it wasn't in person, but I hopefully we'll, we'll manage that in another, another time. Um, I'm sure everyone will clap at their screens, but you won't be able to hear it. So, uh, <laughs> but, but thank you so much. I very much enjoyed thank it. Thank you so much for hosting me, Richard. I really appreciate it. It's been great. Okay. Thank you very much. Bye.